So welcome to this Distinguished Speaker Seminar. Uh, Sir Clive Gillinson is joining us today. For those of you who don't know his illustrious background, uh, joined the LSO, the London Symphony Orchestra, as a cellist in 1970, uh, became a board member in 1976. Now he'll describe more what that means, but the LSO is a self-governing organization, and so cellist and board member. A few years later, in 1984, he became the managing director and we'll go into the details here of what was uh, an organization in turmoil, um, turned it around and then some to make it one of the preeminent musical organizations in this country, um, only to get poached in 2005 to become the artistic and executive director of Carnegie Hall. Uh, so, you know, the old joke about how does get one get to Carnegie Hall, the answer, practice. Uh, in this case, it was also run the LSO first. Uh, so we're thrilled to have Clive here. In addition to all of his expertise, uh, he has a new book out called Better to Speak of It, uh, which I recommend highly to those of you who uh, are enjoying this evening, which gives a lot more background. Uh, some of my questions will be pale, you know, will just, just barely scratch the surface because in an hour there's only so much we can do. So if you want the fuller treatment, uh, the book Better to Speak of It, uh, I would strongly recommend. So Clive, if, if we can just get started. Again, sure. first of all, welcome to the school, welcome to Oxford, and welcome back to uh, this university. Um, you know, our students, the young people out here, often look at our guests and say, look, he's the head of Carnegie Hall and he was the head of the LSO, not realizing that the journey that you've taken to get to that place is hardly a linear one. Um, can you start by giving us a little bit of story? I know you and I talked beforehand about mm -hmm. stories and you know, the story and the narrative. Kind of what's the story that led you to where you are now? So maybe the first part of the story that gets you to the LSO. Absolutely. Well, I think like almost everybody, I'm not in the job I wanted to be in. Um, and <laughs> um, but that's good, not bad. Uh, I started at school, I had two big loves, well, three big loves, um, mathematics, music, and carpentry. And, and so, <laughs> <laughs> completely wild, but um, my mother, was a fantastic cellist, in fact. Uh, I was a cellist, um, but she was a better cellist, much better cellist than I was. And at that time, uh, men basically got all the jobs. She was better than all the men, or pretty well all the men, but the men got the jobs. And so her view was music was not a good profession to go into. So she said, do music for fun, um, but go and do mathematics, get a proper profession. Um, so I went to university to study mathematics. And, and I knew immediately, virtually, that I'd made a mistake, that music had to be my life. Um, so after a year at Queen Mary College in London, um, I packed up and I went to the Royal Academy of Music um, as a cellist. And from there, I, I spent four years there. And then leaving the Royal Academy of Music, I'd, I'd, like every idealistic kid, I wanted to be a soloist. Um, you know, it takes you a while to discover you're not going to be a soloist. Um, but one of the big things around this was the people who can be a soloist are the ones who really can give their best under the pressure of the concert stage, the concert platform. And for whatever reason, I wasn't able to give my best in general um, on the concert platform as a soloist. Um, so like lots of people, I decided I'd join an orchestra. Um, so I auditioned for two orchestras, in fact, the Philharmonia Orchestra of London and the London Symphony. Um, the London Symphony had no jobs at that time in the cello section, and the Philharmonia did have a job, and they offered me a job. So I joined, um, and in fact, that first three months was doing Otto Klemperer's last Beethoven cycle, um, which was, I mean, absolutely historic, extraordinary experience, but extraordinary in lots of ways. I mean, not only was he a great, great musician and a great artist, but he was actually very much a very sick man coming to the end of his life. And you realize that an orchestra has an unbelievable internal understanding between each other as well as between an artist. And, and when he was starting, you know, he'd be sort of shaking like this. And somehow or other, everybody in the orchestra but me as a kid out of college knew which shake it was you started on. <laughs> um, and, you know, so, I mean, my, my entire time through that cycle was actually listening and watching everybody else, because I hadn't a clue um, what he was signifying. But they knew, um, because th th that had been built up over the years. So I, I was in the Philharmonia for three months, and then the London Symphony Orchestra phoned and said, there's a vacancy in the cello section, would you like to come? The LSO was always the orchestra I'd wanted to join, um, because I, I felt it was exciting, it lived near the edge, it was really entrepreneurial, and there was something about it that I loved. 
And so I, I left, I mean, which is not a very good thing to do, but I left after three months um, and joined the LSO. And I played in the cello section then for a number of years, and it was an extraordinary time. We worked with Leonard Bernstein, Claudio Bard, all sorts of truly great conductors. Um, but one of the things that I was aware of is that you go into music because you want to be a creative artist. Um, but the fact of playing in an orchestra, um, it's a little bit like Marilyn Monroe in the chorus line. If you actually want to say to everybody, look at me, you're a disaster. Um, you know, so you've basically got to be part of a, of a highly skilled machine, which means you're not an individual at all. Um, you're an artisan, um, but in a, an extraordinary skilled group. Um, so, I mean, I did find there were times I was beginning to get frustrated by it. I joined the board because, the, um, you know, as Peter said, the orchestra is owned by the players and they are the shareholders um, and they don't actually run the orchestra, but they are the primary board members. And so I joined the board for a while um, and then, in fact, I did start an antique business as well because I was, I was feeling the need um, to do something creative, personally creative, and the antiques and the furniture was part of one of my big loves. And so, uh, you know, I just spent, uh, initially, I just used to go into every antique shop trying to learn about furniture, not with a view to starting business, just because I loved it. Um, and in the end, when my wife and I were deciding what would we do as a business, because we wanted to do something together um, in that way, um, we decided on antiques because I, by that time, knew a lot about antiques and actually was doing all the restoration and everything. So I used to, as a cellist, I was going from playing, I'd do a concert at the Barbican, rush back to the shop, start doing restoration at 11 o'clock at night and working in the shop then. Um, and so, th I mean, that was life for a bit. And then the LSO moved into the Barbican Centre in um, 1982. And it was a disaster because the, um, the guy who was the manager had basically shaped the, the way we were presenting concerts, the subscription series, on an American orchestra model. And that model is for an orchestra that is the only orchestra in, in the town. Um, you know, whether it's the New York Philharmonic, Chicago, whatever they are, they're, they're the only show. If you want to go to a great concert, that's the orchestra. In London, it's not true. There's five top orchestras. And so he came up with this concept with no conception of relating it to the environment. Mm -hmm. And it simply didn't work. We were sitting there. I remember it was the most demoralizing experience as a player. Um, and sitting there, the hall half empty, and you could, you could literally see the money pouring out of the door. Um, he was absolutely certain that the LSO was so important, nobody could let it go, that the public funding bodies would have to give more money. The board didn't agree with him, um, and in fact he was sacked. And uh, Sorry, I'd left out the bit that I had by then left the board because of the antique business. Um, but then when the disaster was happening, I was asked to join the board again. I joined the board and I found when I joined that he had been sacked. And then they advertised for a manager, and they couldn't find a manager. So they thought, well, maybe we can get somebody, one of the players, to go in temporarily whilst we look for a manager. And so I've no idea whether I was last out of the door, or I'm not sure you know, what the reason was. It was me. Um, but it ended up being me, and I went in for three months whilst they looked for a real manager. At the end of three months, they still couldn't find a real manager, so they offered me the job. Can I stop um, the story for a second? Yeah. You get a call and said, Clive, can you be the manager? You've never managed anything. No, absolutely nothing. Uh, <laughs> you've been restoring furniture and playing your cello. Yeah. Tell me about that phone call. Tell me about what went through your mind at that point. Well, I think it's one of those things, I mean, you know the phrase ignorance is bliss. Well, I think had I known anything, I would have said no. Um, <laughs> number one, um, because I, I did know absolutely nothing. And, and it was the only reason I think I felt, you know, I'd, I'd got to do something. But part of the reason as well was I loved the orchestra and I just felt, well, if there's anything I can do to help, I've got to help. Um, so I thought I'd do it. But I also thought there was a bit of me that thought this is an utterly fascinating challenge as well. But I, I think I hadn't thought of it in terms of the fact that it was the lives of, you know, or the livelihood of probably 110, 115 people um, that rested on me. I mean, the orchestra was on the verge of bankruptcy, um, which is, so it was very sensible that nobody applied for the job. Um, but, um, but, you know, so after the three months, they still couldn't find a real manager. And, and, and when they offered it to me, I said no, because for two reasons. Number one, after three months, you have no idea if I'm the right person. Um, number two, 
I've no idea if I want to do it. I've never wanted to be a manager. It's never been something I wanted to do. I always wanted to be a musician. Um, so I'll do it for a year, keep my job open in the cello section for a year, and at the end of the year, you'll know if I'm the right person and I'll know if I want to do it. So at the end of the year, you know, we, by that time we were beginning to sort things out. And I mean, this is where, I mean, interestingly enough, I mean, no, I had never managed, but the mathematics was unbelievably useful because the, the were no, there was no real financial planning. So in terms of setting up systems and everything, it meant that wasn't so difficult for me to, to actually analyze where the problems lay. Um, but, you know, but nonetheless, I mean, it was a ferocious time. Our twins had just been born as well, and they were three months premature, so we weren't getting a lot of sleep. So life was, it was like seeing life through a gauze veil almost. Um, but How soon into it were you able to get the measure of the problem, what it was that you needed to do? Well, it was probably about six months. But I mean, the, the, I've, the toughest part for me was that what you have to do in the short term to save a disaster is you're compromising on so many of the things you believe in. So we were not doing enough rehearsal, we were just doing popular repertoire, we were, do, we were doing the easiest things um, that you could do. Um, we were working with the conductors who were the cheapest conductors. I mean, it was literally how do you save money in every possible way. Um, but at the same time, trying to imagine everything I'd known as a player I wanted the LSO to be. And I guess the, the curious thing for me was, even though I was absolutely sure I never wanted to be a manager, I realized the minute I walked in the door that subliminally I knew exactly where I wanted it to go. Um, because having played in it for 14 years, um, you know, I'd had all the dreams of what it should be and what it should stand for. So, I mean, in a way, one of the most complicated things was dealing with the short term, which was actually pulling everything into shape and doing things that you totally did not believe in, um, you know, in order to get it back into shape. At the same time, trying to define a long-term vision that was absolutely what you believed in. But the LSO is the self-governing organization, kind of like for those who are here at Oxford and Oxford College. So what are the challenges? Because you might have had this vision about what you wanted the future to look like for the LSO. If I understand it, you had to get the orchestra on board. So how do you do that? Well, I think there was a one big advantage, and that was they were desperate. <laughs> and, you know, so, uh, you know, if we hadn't been in a catastrophic situation, I think going from being a player to managing your colleagues, I think probably would have been unbelievably difficult. Um, so, but because they were on the verge of disaster, anybody who was, you know, might be able to save it, by definition, they were going to support. Um, so I think that was, to be honest, that was the key to it. Um, I mean, the, but the thing that's interesting about an orchestra where the players are the shareholders, and I'm sure this resonates here, um, is that you can only govern by taking people with you. You can't tell anybody what to do. You've got to convince them um, and take them with. And part of that, I mean, you know, the biggest thing that had to change was the culture. Um, the culture was very much a self-seeking culture. It was all about the players wanting to run the orchestra for their own benefit. And so trying to change that to a culture where it was always about the music first and how do you use the music to serve people's lives, that was, the, that was actually the toughest thing of the lot so um, to change. That? How do you move from putting music first, from player first to music first. How did you change culture? That was, I think we teach that's one of the hardest things to ever do in our organization. I think it is, the, I mean, so to my mind, do? it's the hardest thing of the lot. And in the end, you've got to find partners. Nobody does it on their own. And so I basically had to seek out and find people in the orchestra, not just on the board, um, but people in the orchestra, talking to everybody and finding the people who genuinely shared what I cared about and what I believed in and what I thought we should be doing. And, and bit by bit, you arrive at a point where, you know, as long as you've got friends and as long as you've got people who are sharing the vision, um, then there's a chance that you start changing people's minds. But it's endless, endless talking. So, I mean, you know, I, I instituted all sorts of things about, I mean, my view about um, information is that information is king. Um, you just absolutely, the most important thing is that you share information in the widest possible way. So I, I instituted something where, you know, I would send briefings out to the orchestra every month. They knew exactly what was going on, a weekly briefing to the board. 
Um, so everybody was very aware of every meeting I was doing, what I was thinking about, and why I was suggesting things. And they could see it evolving, and we'd be able to discuss it on a continuing basis. But I don't think it would have been possible to bring them with in that way without sharing information in a very, very proactive way. Um, and at the same time, um, you know, obviously that involved trying to change attitudes, it involved trying to um, change approaches to the way we did things. Um, so, I mean, changing culture is, lives on so many levels. Um, so it was working on all of these things together. Um, and bit by bit, people start coming with you. And it's a long, long journey. I mean, it literally took years. And it can be an exhausting journey as well, because I found when you're threatening people's self-interest, I found we had, I mean, we also used to have an orchestra meeting, which I instituted every month. So we'd talk about issues as, with the whole orchestra. Um, and when you were threatening people's, you know, the way they'd been operating their jobs, and it actually worked very well for them personally, even though it wasn't particularly good for the music, you know, if they were able to take time off when they wanted to do solo things and so on. I mean, that in a way they could use the orchestra and be there when it suited them, but not be there when it didn't suit them. That's no good for the music. So you had to uh, demand much more of people. And, and those sort of things, I mean, some of the orchestra meetings were ferocious and people were so aggressive and so unpleasant. So it's, part of it is never answering anger with anger. Um, you know, always just staying absolutely cool and being um, rational and reasonable, no matter what people throw at you. And I think if I'd, if I'd actually responded with anger, ever, I'd have lost it. Um, so, you know, and there was so much anger coming my way from them some of the time. But bit by bit it changed. And, and the great thing about culture is, well, the good and the bad thing about culture is it's self-perpetuating. So when you have a bad company culture, it tends to attract people who are attracted by that culture. But equally, once you start changing the culture and people start feeling it's no longer the place for them, they start leaving. And we started attracting the sort of people who believed in where we were trying to go. So, I mean, the great thing is once you start turning that corner, it then gathers its own momentum because people want to join because that's what they believe in. Was there any flashpoint in particular that you remember that you felt if this is the point where it can either go one direction or another? I mean, you said it was a year, multi-year process. It was process. years, yeah. There was no flashpoint. I mean, it was just endless, endless trying to, you have to break it down. Uh, and, and, you know, there were lots of angry flashpoints. Um, but there was nowhere where I thought I'd lost it. Um, but there were lots of times when I thought, I'm never going to get there. Um, but on the other hand, you know, when you've also, if you're not alone, if you're sharing it with other people who, who believe in it, even if you get tired, other people, you know, then can actually say, no, come on, you've got to stick with it. It matters. And, and there was one moment, I remember, which was the moment when... I went home utterly elated because I realised we had genuinely turned the corner in a meaningful way. And that was, we did two repeat concerts at the Barbican Centre. The second one was not as good as the first. And so at the next orchestra meeting, I was clear why it was not as good as the first. Um, but I knew the orchestra would not be because it wouldn't suit them. Um, you know, because again, it, it was because there hadn't been a rehearsal. We'd done the first concert with a rehearsal. Then we'd gone into the next concert the next day, no rehearsal. And so everybody comes off, you know, whatever they've been doing all day, their minds are somewhere else. They sit down and do the performance and they've got to collect themselves that instant. And so I brought it up at the orchestra meeting and I said, why do we, you know, why does everybody think the second concert was not as good? And everybody agreed it wasn't as good. And everybody talked and talked for ages and it was always, it was this person's fault, it was that fault, it was that fault. And then somebody said, I think it was because we didn't have a rehearsal before the second concert. And they started talking um, and in the end they all agreed with that person. Now if I'd suggested it, I would have failed. I mean I had to allow them to arrive there. Just by asking the question, I had to open it up and give them the chance to arrive at the answer. Um, it was no good me coming up with the answer. They did that and at the end of that meeting they voted they would never ever again do a concert without a rehearsal. Even if it was the fourth or fifth performance on a tour, they'd never again do that without some sort of rehearsal. And the reason that was so powerful was they were not getting paid extra for that rehearsal. There was no more money. They had decided on purely musical grounds that it was the right thing to do. And that was a great moment because it was the moment when they had actually demonstrated that they not only understood, but they were make prepared and willing and had actually volunteered to make the commitment themselves that addressed it. 
and that cost them their own personal time to do it. So that was huge. Great. Uh, this is a cue, by the way. I'm going to ask Clive some more questions about this management style of managing by asking questions, which is he talks about in this book. At a certain point in about 20 minutes, I'm going to ask you to ask questions. So just start to prepare. So this management style of managing by asking questions, uh, which you elaborate at some length in the book, and you describe how you turned a board around by asking a set of questions. Um, where did this style come from that you, you thought, well, the best way to manage people is just to ask them lots of questions? Well, I guess, I mean, one of the things I used to be incredibly shy as a kid, and I mean, you know, even in my days as a cellist, um, and the interesting thing was being given a role as a manager, I suddenly found, you know, that actually by being given a role, you can actually play that part and you can have confidence that I never had as a person up until that point. I mean, that was one thing. So, in fact, in a lot of ways, my, I didn't have mentors. My mentors were literature, books. I mean, I just used to read a vast amount and a huge amount of my reading was, was biography or autobiography because I was fascinated by people. And, and I guess it was reading, you know, people like, about people like Einstein, I mean, all sorts of people, but I mean, you know, and Einstein who said, um, you know, that curiosity is far more important than knowledge. Um, you know, and, I mean, all the people I admired were people who actually asked questions. Well, essentially people who had great curiosity. Um, so I think part of it was that was, again, something subliminally I'd learned. But the second thing was going in, you know, from one day being a cellist to the next day being a manager, obviously I knew nothing. And so the only way to try and actually learn and understand what was going on was just to ask endless questions. Um, it was all I could do. So, you know, that, that was what actually taught me that that was the only way to approach it. Um, anybody who thinks they know the answers um, almost never does if they haven't asked questions. And it's one of the things I've learned. I mean, it's very interesting when you work with very powerful people, as I do in New York now with Carnegie Hall, um, there's a lot of people who are absolutely extraordinary in their field. And I don't know whether any of you read Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, but the whole issue around people thinking because they've found the answers in their own area of expertise, that those answers can simply be transferred shorthand to another area. And it's almost never true. Um, and so I think it was, you know, one of those things I found, I mean, you know, is that actually asking questions is at the root of everything. And, and at the LSO, at, at Carnegie Hall, when I first started at Carnegie Hall, um, people would say, at almost every meeting at some point, what's best for Carnegie Hall? And I'd always say it's the wrong question. The only question we should be asking is what's best for the impact music can have on people's lives? If we can answer those, that question, then, and that frames the way we look at everything, then we're starting from the right point. So a lot of people ask questions as well, but they ask the wrong questions. Um, you know, so most of the time at the LSO, the players would be asking what's best for me personally, or what's best for the orchestra later on. Um, even then, it's not right. It's not what's best for the orchestra. It's what's best for the orchestra's role in society in serving people through music. Um, so taking people on that journey, is, it's a huge journey to get them to ask, even be willing to ask the right questions. And that's why that moment when they said it was the fact that there was no rehearsal was such an important one, because they'd been willing to ask themselves a meaningful question. Whereas most of the time, you know, it's so easy to ask the question because you know what you want the answer to be. So, I mean, one of the biggest, um, in a way, vindications of that technique as well was I remember um, in my very early days at Carnegie Hall, um, there was a particular project the chairman was very, very keen on. And I, as I was only starting, everybody said, look, He's an extraordinary guy, you know, fantastic energy, fantastic commitment. You know, he believes in everything. He does not, the one thing he won't stand for is negative attitudes. So if you say you don't think it's a good idea, you're not going to last very long. So, I, you know, I thought, how, how do I deal with this? So at my next meeting with him, I said, would it be useful if I wrote down all the questions that we're going to have to answer if we're going to do this project? And he said, great, okay. So I sent him a list of all the questions, and then when I went to see him a week later, I came in the door and he looked at me and he smiled and he said, we're not doing this project, are we? <laughs> and, <laughs> and I thought, I mean, you know, firstly it was the power of questions. Secondly, 
I thought it was wonderful that he could listen to everything that the questions were saying as well, all the answers that the questions threw up. Um, so, I mean, you still have to have people who are willing to listen, but it, it just demonstrated that, that the power of that, rather than saying, I think it's a bad idea. So you've already alluded to Carnegie Hall a number of times in this recent few minutes. So let's talk about your move to Carnegie Hall. You had been tremendously successful at the LSO. Presumably, someday someone called you up and said, why not New York? Why not Carnegie Hall? Uh, tell us about that transition, but also maybe help us explore. At the LSO, you had a burning platform. You know, the bank, you were a bankrupt orchestra. Carnegie Hall, when you arrived, was probably acclaimed as one of the premier arts organizations in New York City. Absolutely. There's yeah. a world of difference between managing kind of a failure and managing a tremendous success. You've made even at Carnegie Hall, tremendous change in the organization. So there were two questions in there. One, how did you make that transition? How do you think about managing something that's broken versus something that's working really well but could be better? Yeah. Well, I think one of the challenges with something as brilliant as Carnegie Hall is people can't imagine it can be better. Um, I mean, they tend to think this is so extraordinary. And I remember, you know, one of the things that effectively came out of one of the trustees who was interviewing me was, we really want you to be innovative, but please don't change anything. <laughs> you know, so it was, you could, I mean, so they were so scared, you know, that when I was going to mess it up. Um, and, you know, and, and they loved it and treasured it, and it is one of the most treasured organizations in the world. And, and in New York, it's seen absolutely as one of the great icons. And you're right, I mean, it is utterly fascinating and much, in a way, much more interesting to take on an organization that's thriving and say, where next, um, than trying to save an organization and it, at the LSO. It was far more interesting once the thing was saved to be thinking, what can a broader vision be like? You know, all the things we did around building an education program, an education centre, and creating our own record label. And there were so many things we then did. I mean, that was really when it got fascinating, obviously not to mention all the programming ideas. So at Carnegie Hall, I felt it was extraordinary, but most of what they did was brilliant but singular. So it was a series of really great, great concerts um, with the greatest conductors, soloists, orchestras, everybody in the world. Um, but I felt it's really important for the arts to have a much more proactive role in people's lives. And that the arts needs to be about enticing people to take journeys of exploration and discovery. It shouldn't ever be about living in your comfort zone and going to something where you say, I love Beethoven, I'm going to go to another Beethoven night. And, and you don't test yourself, you don't explore, and you don't test your own curiosity or anything. So I thought it would be great to create festivals um, and talk to other arts institutions in the city and see whether one could create journeys of exploration through dance, theatre, film, literature, the lot, um, as well as music, with a context obviously for mu with music as the core of an idea, but then to be exploring across the whole strata of culture. And when I floated this idea internally, everybody said, don't bother, New York organisations don't work together. Um, you know, they're, they're all competing for the same money, so they, you know, nobody will work together. So, I th you know, being a stupid foreigner, I thought I might as well, um, you know, just, <laughs> I thought I might as well go around and, and test it. So I went round to the guy who runs MoMA and the, li the public library and all the different people and just floated the idea and they all said, fantastic, we'd love to do it. Um, now, one of the huge advantages was I was coming from Carnegie Hall. Now, if I'd been coming from an, a lesser organisation, maybe I wouldn't have got the same reception. But the fact is, they all loved the idea, and we created these big festivals. We've now done African-American music, Leonard Bernstein, Latin American music, South Africa, Japan, China, um, all sorts of subjects. And, and next year, we'll be doing the 60s, exploring the 60s, the years that transformed America. Um, so, you know, we really explore what we think are compelling ideas and, and the partnerships are totally different for every project because obviously the partnerships you have for a China festival are completely different for an African American festival um, and so on. And we found, apart from anything, I mean, the South Africa festival, which we did um, a couple of years ago, 60% of the people who came to that have never been inside Carnegie Hall before. And the same applied to almost every organization we worked with. So in other words, we'd created something where everybody was a winner. Um, and that was the whole point. I mean, by audiences traveling outside their comfort zone, um, you know, it meant they were exploring art forms and even areas of music they hadn't explored before. And I remember 
I mean, in our very first festival, which was Berlin, um, that one of our trustees, who only ever comes to classical music concerts, I saw her, she was at a concert which was with a totally way out um, contemporary Berlin ensemble, um, you know, which is something she'd never been seen dead at. Um, and, and so I went up to her, because I saw her at the intermission, at the interval, sorry, wrong language, there was, <laughs> um, at the interval, walking out with her coat, and I went up to her and said, you know, well, you know, fantastic that you came. And she said, well, Clive, do you know the saying, curiosity killed the cat? Well, this cat is dead. <laughs> so, but the point is, she tried. And loads of people had tried. Um, and, you know, and loads of people had found things they did like. Um, that particular one she hated. But, um, but, but the point is, you've got to try. And of course, you're not going to enjoy everything. But the, so that was one big thing I wanted to do. Another thing I wanted to do was I discovered, um, you know, when I arrived, one of the first things people told me was, uh, there's 15,000 music graduates from music schools in America every year and 150 jobs in orchestras. Um, pretty scary statistic. And so it, it opened up the idea for me, which is something I'd always wanted to do, of creating a fellowship program where you train the most brilliant young musicians, not just to be great players, um, but also to learn all sorts of skills so they can work in teaching in schools, work in prisons, in hospitals, youth at risk centres, you know, and have portfolio careers around really trying to transform society. Um, so those were the first two ideas, I, you know, that addressed two things that to me were really fundamental. And the board, it was interesting. I mean, I took them to my first board meeting, both of those ideas, and, and the board did exactly what a board should do which is they were really tough, they were you know, really demanding and you know, really asking all the questions. And of course, you know, you've got to go with a project where you've asked yourself all the toughest questions. It's no good you know, having been you know, thought, well, we've got a fantastic idea, and then you go along and you haven't thought about the difficult questions they're going to ask. So we always, anyway, try and first develop a project in the most exciting, you know, phenomenal way we can, but then we'll try and knock it down and destroy it. And if we can't destroy it, then we think, well, maybe we've got a good idea here. So both of these ideas were ones we'd really thought through, went to the board, they really tried to knock it down, and at the end of the board meeting, there was a, a, a lot of people who said, look, we think they're great ideas, but it's much too ambitious. Don't do both at the same time. Do one at a time. And I said, okay, could I ask one thing of you, because I understand, I'm new, there's no reason you should believe that we can deliver all of this. We think we can. Um, we've thought it through, we've thought out the fundraising campaign, we've thought out how we're going to implement everything. Um, can I be allowed to go and sp speak to every single person who doubts we can do both of them at the same time? If I can't persuade them, then we should do one at a time, but I'd like the opportunity to try and persuade them. So I went to the first person who um, was a trustee, his office was 10 minutes walk away, and we talked for an hour, and at the end of it he said, look Clive, not only do I think they're incredible ideas, but I do think you can do it, and I'd hate you to have travelled all this way for nothing, 10, ten minutes walk, um, I'd hate you to have travelled all this way for nothing, here's half a million dollars to be going on your way. Um, <laughs> um, the next one was in point of fact, the lady who in the Berlin Festival later, um, the dead cat, um, uh, um, and I had lunch with her and talked to her about it. Similar thing, and at the end of it, she said, here's a million dollars to help you do both of them. So they'd, done, they'd asked all the questions, they'd been demanding in all the right ways, they'd, they'd pressured us in every way they should, but at the end of it, when they were persuaded we'd thought it through and we'd asked ourselves the hardest questions, they backed it. Now that's one thing where America does tend to be different from the UK. And I mean, a lot of it's the tax law, a lot of it's the traditions and, and so on of giving. Um, but I, I, I mean, one of the stories I tell there, which is maybe a little bit unfair, is I always say in America, well, in Britain, when I used to go to my trustees, and I'd say, we've got this incredible project, you know, you'd have a fantastic discussion. At the end, they'd say, Clive, that's fantastic. Do keep me in touch and let me know how you're getting on. <laughs> <laughs> in America, they say, how can I help? And, and it's one of the most inspiring things about being there. And, you know, and it is, I mean, it's, it's a fundamental part of the culture. It's not, it doesn't ap apply just to culture. It applies to hospitals and, you know, and all the things that are totally dependent on private funding. But, so that was the beginning of the journey. And I think what they'd done right as well was, obviously, I was new. They should challenge me and question me. There's no reason to believe that I could deliver. 
and and so it's become easier and easier for them. So we've now created the National Youth Orchestra of America. We've done, you know, we've done a host of extraordinary projects which have completely transformed Carnegie Hall and, and the way we tend to, we now reach 600,000 kids a year with all our education programs, um, which was, you know, it was less than 100,000 when I arrived 11 years ago. So, um, you know, we're looking at every way that we can trans use this extraordinary organization to transform the society we live in. And it's one of the thrills of, being at the helm of such a great organization is the fact that it can change the world around it more than, uh, you know, however much the LSO had been successful, it could never change the world in the way that Carnegie Hall can. And so you've got to use the power of the institution to transform the world around you in that way. You've brought up the board a number of times. You said you had to convince them the first instance you went around and I wish I had the same ability to go to my board and give them ideas and have them write checks. Um, could you give well, the you're audience... In, you're in England. Uh, that's true. <laughs> uh, working on that. Um, so not everyone will understand the structure of your board. I think it's 75 individuals, is roughly. Yes, yes. Uh, which is a massive board. Sometimes it worked well. There are other times it was more challenging. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's a British way, I think, of putting it. It's very delicate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so you've, the good side is they get behind you when you're bringing up new ideas, but can you say anything about when it works managing a board of 75 high-powered uh, rich folks is more difficult? It's much more difficult. Um, but I think worth saying as well, this is not 75 people who are actively trustees. Um, probably 35, maybe 40 are active. And there's a tradition, which I like, uh, which is that people who did a lot for the organization in the past should still be honored. Um, so they're on the board, they're not really participating in a major way. So there's about 30 people out of that 75 who in a way are there because you're honoring the legacy mm -hmm. that they've given to the organization. Um, so, I mean, the, but the big challenge, I mean, I don't know whether you're referring to what happened last year, but... Um, you want to bring it up? Um, <laughs> I, I think one of the challenges about working in an environment um, where there is virtually no public funding, everything has to be raised, is there's always a danger that people chase money. And, you know, that is, it's, it's very easy to think, well, if somebody's going to offer a lot of money, you know, great to give them either some power or to give, you know, to, to chase the project. Now, one of the things I learned in my very early days at the LSO, it was almost the first lesson I learned, is that money follows vision. If you don't have an absolutely clear vision and you start chasing money, you end up with an organization that just has all sorts of bits which bear no relationship to the whole. So, I mean, I, mean, I will tell you just one little story, which is, you know, because the lesson I learned at the very beginning, I, I think I was very lucky to learn it. Um, and there were two parallel lessons, actually. One was when I started as manager, the first day um, I started as manager, we'd got a huge project planned with Claudio Bardo, the great conductor. Um, it was a huge and incredibly expensive project, wonderful, um, but very, very expensive, with all the greatest artists in the world, a lot of contemporary music. Um, it was Mahler Vienna in the 20th century. So it was a real look at the impact of Mahler on music in the 20th century. Um, and the board said to me, you've got to go and see Abado and tell him we can't do it. We can't afford it. We're, bank we're on the verge of bankruptcy. So I went to see Abado, and in his wonderful way, um, Abado spoke perfectly good English until he didn't want to understand. Um, and so when I told him this, he said, Clive, I don't understand. <laughs> and, and, and so we talked it over. We talked for several hours. And by the end of it, he persuaded me we should do it, that we had to do it, that it was so important. Um, and I mean, his English did come back to him. Um, <laughs> and so he persuaded me we had to do it. And I went back to the board and I said, look, I've spoken to him, Claudia's view is, about his view is, that if we don't do it, what do we exist for? What's the point? This is a, you know, a life-changing project. So they said, well, do you think you can raise the money? And I said, yes. And obviously I hadn't the slightest idea whether I could. But the point is, when, you, when something is a project that you feel the world cannot live without, and that's a lens I try and apply to every single thing we do. Um, you know, it's no good having a project which you think is a good project. It's got to be a project that's so compelling that anybody you tell about it will feel it's got to happen. And that's what I felt about this. Now, the other one that happened in parallel 
was I'd heard Mr. Slav Rostropovich, the, you know, who to me, um, you know, one of the, I think probably the greatest cellist who's ever lived, one of the greatest musicians who's ever lived. Um, I'd heard just when I started that he was going to be celebrating his 60th birthday and he was going to be celebrating it with two other London orchestras. And I asked his manager, well, why are they sharing it? Because this is one of the greatest artists, should be one orchestra, so there's a single focus just on him. And she said, well, they can't afford it. And I, you know, and I said, well, we'll do it. Um, and she said, but hang on, they're in financially very good state. You're on the verge of bankruptcy. I said, that is the way it has to be done. He deserves that, and I promise we'll find the money. And so she went to him and said, there's this lunatic at the London Symphony Orchestra, and, you know, and told him what I'd said, and, and told him that I was a cellist. And he, you know, and he asked her all the questions, and then he said, if he believes in me like that, I believe in him. And what's more, he's a cellist. <laughs> um, so, so he brought it to us and it was actually one of the, ch uh, you know, those two things were right at the beginning and they were the turning points. Um, we raised money for both of them. Um, UBS, the big bank, came in for Rostropovich's birthday series and they became one of our biggest sponsors, in fact. Um, so, I mean, ironically, with both those projects, we ended off artistically, obviously, monumentally better off, but we ended up financially better off. And it was a colossal lesson that if you compromise to save money and you try and play safe, you almost certainly end up in a worse place. And that actually, you know, even when things are worst is when you actually have to do the things that are utterly compelling, which obviously is more risky. But I guess, again, I mean, one of the things I've learned in my time as in management is the greatest risk you can ever take is trying to avoid risk. So I have a whole series of questions here, but I have a great audience out there. So rather than continue with mine, I'd like to open it up to you all in the next 20 minutes. Who'd like to get started? If you can give your name and if you can make this question short, please, just so we have the benefit of, of hearing the answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hi. Um. Hi, my name is Wenji. I'm the MBA student. I love classical music and I'm an architect. So from my past experience, I realized a lot of artists have um, strong personalities. Can That's I ask sure. you how to convince them when they are very passionate about their own ideas? Well, I've always felt my job is twofold as regards artists. Firstly, it's to bring in the greatest artists, you know, and that's soloists, conductors, orchestras and so on, it's to bring in the greatest artists to Carnegie Hall. The other thing, and before that the LSO, the other thing that I think it's important to remember is nobody goes to a concert to listen to what the manager thinks is a good idea. Um, they, if they go to hear Rostropovich or whoever it is, or you know, Jesse Norman, they want to hear what matters to that artist. And so my job is one, firstly bringing them in, engaging them with the organization, but then secondly, finding a way of getting them to deliver something that is utterly what they believe in, but is also what we can believe in as well. And our, prob our challenge is that we've got all these singular pieces, you've got all these great, great artists all wanting to do different things, and somehow one's got to finesse a situation where you talk to them and engage them with their idea. Everything's got to be their idea, and they've certainly got to think that. Um, <laughs> and, and, but at the same time, where you're creating a totality, the entire season has to mean something as a whole. So, I mean, the answer is, it's all about relationships, but I think everything in life's about relationships. Um, it's all about building relationships with them, and it's all about them genuinely trusting you, and you meaning it, that what you want to do is do something that is a pure expression of what they believe in, but equally can work for you. So, I mean, it's, it's a very, very difficult balancing act, um, but it's all built on trust and relationships and the fact that they know that you really want their voice to be the voice, not just as a performer, but their voice as an artist is the voice that's going to come across. But of course they're difficult. And I mean, there's times, I remember one con conductor who, you know, wanted to do a particular project, but I thought another conductor was the right conductor for that project. And so, you know, I, I gave it to the one who I thought was the right one for that artistic project. And for 20 years, that person would still mention the project I hadn't given them. Um, so, I mean, you know, so there are times you, you just have to, you're the messenger, and, uh, and the messengers get shot. <laughs> okay, uh, next question. Gentleman in the, right there. Yeah, please. 
Hi, my name is Adeni, uh, Major Programs Management. Uh, my question centers around the issue of culture and arts. Uh, you've so touched on it, culture and arts. Right. You've touched on it quite quite a bit, uh, but uh, the way I see it is, uh, art is an expression of culture. So because of that, there is a kind of uh, wall around different art forms and art expressions. So my question is, how do we increase the inclusiveness of heart. You've touched a bit on that, but I, I want you to touch on you know, real practical steps that one can take to do that. I think you're absolutely right. It's a really important question. Um, so I didn't mean yours wasn't an important question as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, I mean, let me say first, with, with all the education work we do, we don't have any particular sort of music. In other words, um, for us, it's the best of every sort of music. So it may be classical music, you know, some of the work will be classical music, pop, rap, country music. The kids don't know which is which, because um, we, we don't think you should define categories in that way, because categories can then make people think, well, that's not mine. Um, so, you know, one of the things is just to have music be music, and great music, and engage the kids so that they love all sorts of music, and that they don't realize that Mozart is classical, and you know, and Jay-Z is, is hip hop or whatever it is. Um, you know, so that's really important. The other piece is, it's one of the big reasons I wanted to do these big festivals, where we explore all these completely different subjects. As I said, like African American music, Latin American music, but China, Japan, Berlin, and so on. I mean, South Africa. So it means we're talking to many, many different audiences. And I think one of the important things to realize is no arts organization is talking to one audience. You're talking to many audiences. And the most important thing is to try and get people to travel across experiences. Because one of the things I, I don't like and I think is patronizing is if people, when people say, if you're going to have African Americans come into a concert at Carnegie Hall, you've got to do music that's relevant for an African American, or Latino, Latino, or Irish, Irish. Um, I don't think it's true. I mean, to, to imply that people can't enjoy any music that isn't of their own background, um, I don't. I think is patronising and is absolutely wrong. Um, equally, we've got to be talking to many, many people and many different audiences. We've got to be relevant across a city that's unbelievably multicultural. I mean, I think almost more so even than London. Um, you know, there are so many different races, languages, um, cultures, backgrounds. So it's something we try and do as extensively as we can. I mean, we're not about classical music, we're about all music. Everything that we present in the hall is about the best of all music. Um, but we also do want to try and market across genres to people so that we're encouraging audiences to travel, to travel journeys with us as well and explore. So I think it's a, in that way, it's a two-way street, but it's a, it's a very challenging one. Okay, uh, let's go over to Sally over here. That's, I'm Sally Maitlis, I'm a professor of organizational behavior here. And I was just interested in the tension I was, uh, thought I was hearing between cooperation and collaboration in your role in, in these different organizations and struck by the story you just told about Rostropovich and I think in your book which I enjoy very much the story you told about Colin Davis and sort of getting him back from the Philharmonia mm -hmm. and so you, you've talked about collaborating with all these organizations uh, and sort of expanding the pie but it also sounds like you know there's a certain number of Rostropoviches and conductors to go around and, and you had to fight the other London orchestras to get them. Life's competitive. <laughs> There's no getting away from that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, my view is, firstly, you never succeed by others failing. I mean, so I don't see competition in that way. That, um, but I do see equally that if my job is, which I think it is partly, to bring in the greatest artists of every kind, then yes, I'm going to be competing with other organisations. But you should never do anything unethical. And I'll give you an example of something that I think is important, and that is... When I was at the London Symphony, I, one of the things I thought was really important, if we were going to transform our international profile, 
I thought probably the most important place to do that was New York, to establish a presence in New York. Because one of the things about London orchestras, London Philharmonic, London Symphony, Philharmonia, um, Royal Philharmonic, uh, overseas nobody knows the difference. You know, so if you're going to try and establish a unique identity, you've got to think, how do you do that? So I thought going to New York and establishing an annual residency would be the key. So um, I went to New York and talked to Carnegie Hall and put this idea to them of doing a, th a three concert series, you know, mini festival each year um, on an ongoing basis. And the person who was running Carnegie Hall at that time said, I think it's too risky. We're not prepared to do it will offer you perhaps two concerts, but not three. And I said, well, in two, you can't really do something that's a coherent, meaningful project. So I'm going to have to go and talk to Lincoln Center. So I went and talked to Lincoln Center, and Lincoln Center jumped at it. And we established an annual residency, and they did this big festival with us every year, and it was hugely successful. And then a few years later, Carnegie Hall came to me and said, would you bring it to Carnegie Hall? And even though Carnegie Hall is by far the better hall, I said no because you didn't back us at the beginning, they did, so I think we have to stay loyal to them. When I left the London Symphony and the new manager took over, I, I said to her, I just want you to know this story and I want you to know that I'm not going to be inviting you to Carnegie Hall um, and this is why I'm not going to be inviting you because I think you have to stay loyal. So, I mean, I think there's things you have to do that are right as well, but it doesn't mean it's not competitive, but it's got to be competitive, you know, where you really have values that you live by. Next, uh, maybe the gentleman in the back, and then we'll come back over to you. Yes, behind you. Hi, uh, my name is Rushal. I run um, an Indian classical orchestra slash ensemble. I was wondering, because in an environment of um, sort of austerity, in an environment where we're facing economic difficult times and things like that, how do you get private corporations in different sectors and um, you know different organizations to uh, how do you convince them to fund the arts? How do you convince them that arts and music is something that's worth funding? Well, in the end, it's always people. It's always about people. I mean, if you... And, and it's also... I mean, the thing I learned... When I started managing, I said there's two things I'll never do. Um, one is make speeches, um, and the other is raise money. So now I'm in New York spending most of my time doing those two things. Um, but... One of the things that never matters is what you want to sell. The only thing that matters is what somebody else wants to buy. And so, and that was, and that was when I learned, I actually enjoyed fundraising. I love fundraising now. And that is because it's actually about sharing vision. It's not about asking for money. And it's about having a, something you up, utterly believe in, something you utterly believe has to happen. And you just talk to people, you ask for connections, you try and make connections. But in the end, if you're talking to somebody um, who doesn't care about music, 99% certainly, however good your project, you won't sell it to them. So you've got to build networks, you've got to actually make sure you're connecting with people and getting other people to connect you and so on. And you just grow your networks in the most dynamic way you possibly can. But then it's about listening much more than talking. And, you know, it's about hearing what do they want? What do they care about? What does the other person care about? And when you find what they care about, you, if you run the organization, can shape something that you're doing to be something that meets their objectives. Um, it doesn't mean you transmute it in any way. You don't change it, but it's the way you present it is that it's actually something that meets their objectives. And uh, at least then you've got a chance. It doesn't mean you're going to win every time, but that gives you the best chance. So all I can say is it's, it's totally about people. Um, it, you know, you've got to meet the right people. You've got to meet the people who are going to care and where it matters. And then secondly, I mean, in, you know, one of the things in America, they say in American fundraising, is you've got two ears and one mouth. Use them in that proportion. Um, you know, that probably applies to a lot of other things apart from fundraising. Um, but, but it's absolutely true. You know, you've got to hear what somebody wants. And then you've got to, if you've got nothing that meets that, then you're not going to be able to, it's not going to work. But equally, I find the number of times, if I hear what somebody wants, I can shape something that we're doing so that there's a way of meeting their objectives and, and meeting our objectives. Okay, this gentleman over here. Uh, hi, um, <coughs> I'm Matyash. I study mathematics at this university. Um, I was uh, interested 
to kind of ask a bit more um, about sort of cr crisis management. That um, so you mentioned that uh, when you started out at the London Orchestra, the organization was on the brink of bankruptcy. A lot of people were depending on it, and I'm just sort of wondering what the psychology is between sort of facing all of these overwhelming pressures and putting all of that aside, and as you said, sort of focus on the broader sort of uncompromising vision of what you want the organization to be? Well, you've simply got to be able to do both at the same time. But one is about short term and one is about long term. And so if all I'd done was work out how we were going to save the orchestra and do the, all of, you know, the restructuring, the financial things that meant we could actually get rid of the deficit, if all I'd done was that and hadn't actually been defining a vision that could inspire the orchestra as well, if they had felt that the job to do was simply to get rid of the deficit, then how are they going to get excited? How are they going to feel there's actually a purpose in this? This is leading somewhere. So I felt it was really important to, you know, whilst doing that, which frankly I found demoralizing, you know, doing things that really weren't as good as they should be. I mean, it was really demoralizing. It was completely counter to everything I believed in, but it had to be done. Well, it was all I could see anyway, in terms of how one solved the problems short term. But at the same time, beginning to talk all about what the long-term vision needed to be. And in that way, I think I was lucky as well. I mean, the Abado project, the Malavian of the 20th century, and the Rostropovich project. I mean, the fact that both of those came up as possibilities right at the beginning. So I was able to talk about two things that were utterly compelling and, and really, you know, I mean, you know, verge on life-changing. I mean, you know, they had colossal impact on people. So that we were talking about those in the medium to longer term at the same time as the, the bad stuff which got you through was really important. I mean, people have got to have something to believe in. And, I mean, I won't get on to politics, but just to touch on politics, I mean, if one just thinks for a minute about what's happened in Britain recently with Brexit, what's happened in America recently with the election, where you don't have messages of hope, you have messages of, you know, things that actually make people angry, that, that exploit anger, that exploit um, insecurity, all the things, you know, that are, you know, when, when it, it becomes about exploiting negatives rather than actually being able to enunciate positives and things that actually get people excited and hopeful, it's very dangerous. And, you know, and so I think it's all about, even if you've got difficult things to do, there's got to be something that inspires people at the end of it so that you actually get the energy flowing into positive things rather than into destructive things. Great. Next question. Martin. Um, Clive, that was brilliant, and thank you. And uh, from a purely personal point of view, I'm having flashbacks of my association with the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment for the last 30 years, which you can't believe. My question to you is, <laughs> how do we clone you? Um, <laughs> I mean, you're such an unusual person, and you've achieved so much rising from the ranks of the cellist section to doing what you're doing now via the LSO. And it's, it's such an amazing story. And one of the things I think we're all painfully aware of is the shortage of people who really have the necessary management skills to do the kinds of things that you've been doing and that we all aspire to, to doing. And one doesn't see much going on in the conservatoires to teach people how to manage. And there I say, Peter, I don't think we see much going on in the business schools about teaching people to manage in the arts. Could you comment? Is that Peter or me? <laughs> <laughs> I asked the question. <laughs> um, Firstly, look, I completely agree with you. The whole thing about nurturing talent is one of the most important things of the lot. And, I mean, one of the things... I was very lucky, um, but, I mean, more psychologically than in any other way, right at the very beginning, because when I went literally from day one day to the next, from being a cellist to a manager, um, I decided I'd go to America to go to the American Symphony Orchestra League Conference because everybody in Britain said, the Americans are brilliant at arts management, we're useless... Um, you know, they're so much more professional. So I thought, well, I'll go there and meet with them. So I wrote to lots of managers, and a small number agreed to meet me, all of them but one, for about 10 minutes. One person said, um, let's have lunch. 
and we sat and talked for about two and a half hours. I asked him every question I could think of. And at the end of it, he said, and if at any time you want to talk about anything and bounce things off me, uh, you know, ideas, questions, whatever, always be in touch. Now, I found that incredibly moving. I mean, that was Ernest Fleischmann um, at the Los Angeles Philharmonic. And uh, to me, that was incredibly important because of just what it said to me. And from that day onwards, which was literally the, virtually the first day I was in, in management, I've always done everything I can to mentor um, young you know, people who want to go into management. Um, you know, I always say to everybody, my door is open. Anybody who asks to meet, I always see them. I never turn anybody down who wants to talk about career or, you know, discuss career. Um, it's why I created this fellowship program, the two-year fellowship program, to train young musicians, you know, to develop all these skills, I mean, including entrepreneurial skills, all of those things. It's why that program was created. So I think you're absolutely right. And one of the things that always struck me you know, when I think, I mean, you know, if I just think, for instance, of my oldest daughter who was here at Oxford um, studying PPE. Now, I met all her friends. Lots of them loved music. And not one of them would have dreamt of putting arts management on their career path. It wouldn't have occurred to them. And there is nowhere that actually picks that up. You know, and I wish that universities would actually think of that as actually one of the possible career paths and maybe you know do some sort of course that enables people to have a window into what that opportunity is. I mean, I cannot imagine a better life than being in arts management. It's been the most thrilling, exciting thing that could ever have happened to my life. And every day is different. The challenges are eternal and they're always different. Um, you know, there is no repetition. And I wake up every day excited about all the possibilities and the things that you want to do and could do. Um, so I think there's a huge number of people with the talent, with the ability, um, even with the background, um, who could do this, but where we're not even on their radar. And so I actually do think it's something where, you know, a lot of organizations, business schools, you know, could be helping and where it, it would have a huge impact on society. Can I follow up? And I'll take the last question. Um, so uh, it's a corollary of Martin's question. One can think about bringing management skills into the arts. What we're trying to do here is to think about ways to bring the arts and humanities to inform how we manage. So as you know, if you look at the history of management, there was a period of scientific management, Deming's work and others. Uh, and then economics as a driver of management, anthropology, sociology. But you're coming at this from a background in the arts. What can we as students and as professors who are studying business and management learn from a perspective that you take from the arts that will improve not arts organizations but broader organizations? Well, I mean, to me, the thing that underpins every single thing one does is values, number one. And values are universal. I mean, it's nothing to do with which area of management you're in, um, number one. Number two, a lot of the things we've talked about today, like questions are more important than answer, money follows vision, um, you know, lots of the things we've been discussing, I think those are universal. Um, what I don't think is universal is what people used to think. I mean, when I think back to Margaret Thatcher's time, you know, that if you can run a car company, you can run an orchestra. You know, it doesn't matter which the business is, you can just switch. I, I didn't, actually don't believe that. I think you have to genuinely understand the product. Um, I mean, I may be wrong, but that's my own personal view, is that you have to. Um, and I've seen people go into jobs where they do not understand the product, and they're a catastrophe because they don't know any of the questions to ask, they don't understand what it is the purpose of the organisation is. And if you don't understand the, why something exists, there's no way you can manage it. Um, so I think most of the things we've talked about today are totally transplantable. I mean, they're nothing to do with managing in the arts. Um, there's a few things that are relevant to managing the arts that are different in business, and, and that is in the arts we're staggeringly wasteful. Um, you know, when one just thinks about some of the great projects we've done, I mean, like the South Africa Festival or the, you know, whatever it is, we can't do South Africa again for another 10 years, probably, because we can't repeat ourselves. The whole point about the arts is you're always exploring and you're always traveling new journeys. Now, I mean, if you make a brilliant car or you make something that really works, you want to do as many of them as possible. So, I mean, in that sense, we are, you know, we're 
crazily wasteful um, because we're always about exploring human imagination and human creativity and, and human curiosity. So, I mean, um, you know, and human experience. So, I mean, in that way, it's very, very different. But I think in terms of the values and the, you know, the approaches and the way one thinks about management, to me, they're, they're universal. And I think that's a great place to end. Uh, for those of you who are students here, part of what we hope that you're going to learn, not only from this course, but this evening, is that there's an artistry of management. And I think that no one represents that better than you do, Clive. Thank you for sharing Thank you. with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.